Hey guys, it's your main man Donnie here, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this episode. If you notice, we didn't have a regular scheduled programming just yet. That is because we are on the precipice of Star Wars Celebration. As you may have seen, we already have the Episode 9 trailer and title out. Spoiler alert, it is The Rise of Skywalker, and it is out already. The trailer is incredible. We're going to break this down along with all of the Celebration news that comes out this week, which is why we didn't publish our regular episode. Instead, we're publishing the episode History by the Punt, which is a fantastic celebration of history and beer, moderated by none other than yours truly, me. We're excited for this opportunity. We love the History Center for supporting us, and I can't wait for you guys to listen. Tune into this episode here for History by the Pint, a craft business discussion, and we will see you guys in a few days for the celebration recap coverage. You are in for a treat, a uh, wonderful panel discussion, moderated by Donnie Gallagher. Uh, he's also the host of Craft Brews and e News podcast and a beer expert. And he'll be talking to, from closest to me going further, uh, Christian, Carla, and Leonard. Uh, Christian is the owner of Brew Floor and Brown Bar. You can learn more, of course, about all three of them. Uh, Carla is a home brewer and uh, manager of Overflow Brewery and a member of the Tampa Bay Beer Week Committee. And Leonard, not to say you guys are doing anything interesting, but uh, fascinated even more so by Leonard because Leonard is trying to do the impossible, and that's to grow hops in Florida. And so, um, without any further ado, I welcome the panelists and Don. Thank you all so much. Thank you, and thank you for having us. Um, how's everybody doing tonight? Good. Good. We're happy to see you guys, and uh, we have a lot to talk about. As uh, as we alluded, there's a there's a, a panel of very unique and diverse. Craft your knowledge in front of us, so we're gonna just dive right into it on the instant of time. So, we ran through the introductions pretty quickly, but um, just a few minutes, guys, if you can kind of elaborate as to, to why you're here tonight and, and why we're talking to you. Christian, we'll start with you. Uh, so, my name is Christian Brugal, I'm uh, one of the owners of the Brew Floor and Brow Bar here in uh, officially in Odessa, kind of northwest Tampa area. Um, we opened our doors uh, just over a year and a half ago, my wife and I. I'm here, I guess, I, I, our bar focuses exclusively on Florida breweries. We carry a variety of beers from across the state. Um, so it's a constant rotation of beers. Our, our bar goes all the time. We bring as many different breweries from across the state to the, our small little local area in Odessa. So Christian's also very modest. So I don't know if anybody was aware of, of uh, Florida House Bill 107 in 2015 that passed. It actually enabled the state to sell a new volume of beer. And if you walk through the exhibit upstairs in the fourth floor, you'll see that. Previously, it was only 32 ounces and 128, so a gallon to a couple pints. There was nothing in between. And uh, Carla's got a great story for it. We'll get to that in a second. But actually, Ms. Carla, why don't you, uh, why don't you take us from there? All right, so uh, my name is Carla Grave, and I cover a lot of ground here in beer land. Um, I do work for Overflow Brewing, which is in St. Pete. It is where we on April 20th. It is a super rad space. Uh, we specialize in sour beers and shenanigans. Um, I also sell uh, craft beer exclusive t-shirts from a company called Hop Thought, which caters to literally every brewery in the entire Tampa Bay area, which is, if you have lost count, 96 uh, from Spring Hill to Sarasota. It is a lot of breweries that uh, I get to hang out with. Um, I am the merchandise manager of Tampa Bay Beer Week, so I also sell a lot of breweries beer shirts, a lot of beer festivals. I get drink a whole bunch, and that is fun. <laughs> uh, and I run one of the largest beer groups in Tampa Bay uh, called The Port, and we have all of your, from new people that are getting into craft beer into um, all of your beer bros that are standing in line at two in the morning uh, to get exclusive beers. If you did not realize that people stood in line, in line in the morning at two in to buy craft beers, now you know which we are the same. So that is a choice that you can make if you really want to be a hatred boy. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's insane is one definition for it. But, <laughs> um, so the way that they relate back to each other, we, we discovered upstairs, we were talking about that, the 64 ounce growler bill. That's what launched, uh, essentially, what, what, what encouraged Christian to launch his business. And so in doing so, uh, we, we were again talking upstairs, and, and Carla had this funny joke about why a 64 ounce grill or, or growler was not uh, previously legal. I mean, it had been illegal for almost 70 years after Prohibition, but then why would it be, uh, what, was the, what was the old wives tale? Okay, so the official reason that our politicians had given us for not being allowed to have 
Ms. Crowder is because you could reasonably, and I'm really not joking with this one, tell your wife you had drank it only one on your way home, <laughs> and it would be that entire half gallon for hours, but that it's apparently just one, and you can tell your wife it was just one, and that's why we're not allowed to sell that. Or we're not allowed to sell that. Because if you're drinking a 64 ounce crowder, your only problem is lying to your wife, apparently. <laughs> Which is a problem in itself. We'll it's come to that on a different session. It's no group of shenanigans. Only that. So, thank you, Carla. And so, I, I just found that was so funny because, again, that inspired Christian, and now we have Carla's great story. But last but not least, Mr. Leonard doing something else that's extremely historical, specifically in the state of Florida. Leonard? Um, our family moved to Florida in the 1880s, and so I'm a fourth generation farmer, and my son's working with us. So, uh, we're actually into our fifth generation here in Florida. Uh, we've been growing citrus and kumquats, and if, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the kumquat grower, uh, kumquat festival in Dade City. Every year in January, we attract 40,000 people to that festival. It's the same weekend as Gasparilla, so we're able to get 40,000 people not to go to Gasparilla and go to Dade City instead. <laughs> Um, and so our, our family has been, you know, we were devastated like all the other uh, farmers in the state with the uh, citrus greening and the uh, diametes uh, beetle that's destroyed all the agriculture. And so we've, uh, with the kumquats, we actually, related to the festival, uh, started doing, uh, some of the brewers started doing kumquat beers. Actually, the first brewer to buy kumquats for us for a kumquat beer was Alaska Brewing Company 15 years ago. Uh, and then Anchor, Steve Anchor Brewing out of California. So it took a long time to work from the West Coast back to the East Coast, back, home, back to our home turf to uh, be able to use the kumquats in the beer. And then so because we we love beer and uh, we've had these relationships with some of the brewers. We decided to work with the University of Florida out of Lapopka and uh, they said, oh, it's possible to grow hops in Florida. So we decided three years ago to give it a go. And so we've been uh, going through the trials and tribulations to figure out how to make it work in Florida. Yeah, it certainly is something that, that is a, a, a unique uh, farming, you know, crop to, to pick up, especially in Florida, the heat and, and the style that you have to, you know, we talked about this previously, there's essentially a green belt, no, no joke aside, that you can grow hops around the entire planet. Of course, Germany lands perfectly right in that space, right? Which is why they, you know, they're known for their beer, but um, it's just very interesting that Leonard and his, his team and his family are finding a way to do this, but um, in additional history news, Tampa Bay Beer Week. You want to talk about that a little bit, Ms. Carla? I know that not everybody may know about it, but they may have seen it before. Did you have a chance at Beer Week? Goodness, guys. Uh, so it is typically the first week in March. Uh, so we just got out of Tampa Bay Beer Week. Uh, we ended it, and we're the second through the 11th, because we don't know how long the week is. And we will talk about that. Um, but we also don't, we don't do Tampa Bay Beer Week if it coincides with uh, St. Patrick's Day. So next year we're going to throw you off because it's actually the second week in March, but we also feel okay about that. Uh, Tampa Bay Beer Week starts uh, with the Ultimate Brewer Festival, which is really just how we allow all of the brewers in the entire bay that want to come play with us to um, brew really bad beer. Uh, so it is the chop for beer, and you get uh, two grab bag ingredients that almost never sound like they're going to go together off the bat and our brewers because they're phenomenal somehow find a way to make them delicious and then you do a blind taste test on all of the beers you only know what ingredients your brewer had been given and you have no other information you don't know what brewery did it you don't know like what style they're going to do you just know that you got stuff with like plums and coriander and you did your best uh, which those are some of the nicer ingredients we've given out we really throw them under the bus and it's quite entertaining um, but it's a it's a good opportunity for the brewers themselves to just kind of let off steam and compete with each other on a fun beer that they enjoy making and can have a little bit of fun with so we do that competition and that starts our beer week and then we end at seventh sun on both ends of the bay at in Seminole Heights and in Dunedin and seventh sun will do 
Hangover Day, which is the last Sunday of that week, and it is where all of us drag our feet and somehow we're still standing, and we fit tons and tons of events in that time, in those 11 days. So we do Hoon Poo's Day, which is a massive event. Um, have we been to Hoon Poo's Day before? No. All right, Hoon Poo Day is super cool. Um, it is national, international, amazing brewers, literally what we in Beerland call all of the whales. So like that, that elusive beer that you've been hunting is gonna show up at this festival. Um, and you can try it and hang out with us and really all the top of you could want. But uh, Wind Poo's Day is a destination for Tampa Bay. So uh, because of this, we have about 30,000 people show up to Tampa Bay for Tampa Bay Beer Week. Um, we are starting to very easily shift our tourism money from being the beaches, which are still super rad and we love a lot, into beer. So there are 97 breweries in the bay all of them put on something cool for Beer Week. Christian does something really rad for Beer Week. Um, and this brings people from around the globe into our city just looking for cool beer that they couldn't get before. Uh, they pile into Hoon Poo's Day and try all these really really amazing international beers. Uh, Hoon Poo's Day is put on by Cigar City. Um, Wayne Rambles and Joey Rayner have done great things for our city. Um, and they really put Tampa Bay on the map for beer. So uh, check it out, hang out with us next year for Tampa Bay Beer Week. Um, literally everybody in the Bay does something super rad. So no matter what side you're on, you can do something cool. It, it really does come together, and actually, so Christian, your, your brewery is actually in Odessa, or your brewery is your, your, your bar is actually in Odessa. And I thought it was also very unique and relevant for this patent panel is that we're at the Tampa Bay History Center and all you serve is Florida beer. I mean, it's gotta be a challenge in itself. Um, to do that, to source that beer. I mean, 96 breweries, maybe not just in Tampa Bay alone, but but I'm sure that you know when you guys wanted to start this thing, you know, what was going through your head? So yeah, when the our original plan when we started thinking about the growler and focusing on the growler, uh, we started to do our research. We wanted to be uh, focused on Florida. I don't know. I think you know, our initial plan wasn't necessarily all Florida, but as we did more and more research, this was over three years ago. Um, it was. I was surprised, even as much as I saw it in real time, growing in Tampa Bay specifically and then across the state, whether it was Miami or Jacksonville. Um, when you actually looked at the numbers, it was incredible to think how quickly the state was growing. Had, you know, uh, Florida was way behind the times uh, five years ago, and they had caught up uh, very, very quickly in terms of, uh, uh, so I considered Florida back in 2016, when we first built our business plan, it was the fastest growing state from a total brewery standpoint, um, and then just number of you know, total production as well. And then when you kind of put that together with the number of people in Florida, our whole thing was why not focus on the state? There's so many great breweries from across the state. It became, it should be relatively easy to get all these different beers on tap and to just highlight all of the uh, local spots across the state. Uh, not, you know, it, it, I was naive to think at first that we'd be able to drive to breweries and pick up beer and have anything I could get on tap as long as the breweries wanted to sell it. But so there's obviously some challenges or, 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 or things that don't allow that. But uh, but yeah, sourcing has been uh, it can be challenging at times, but for the most part, it's relatively easy because we have you know I think Carla Hood, I think there's 95 or 96 in Tampa Bay. There's about 315, 320 across the state right now. Uh, there's a lot of phenomenal beer and. and I think Florida as a whole is on the map. They are nationally known. Tampa Bay Beer Week is a perfect example of that. Um, the amount of people that travel to the area, sure. Tampa specifically, and you've got different cool beer fests popping up across the whole state. Um, Orlando does one. You know, White Fest in Miami is a big national one now as well. Um, Jacksonville has a few. Um, it just made sense to yep. to focus on Florida. There's no reason not to. Understand, Larry? Um, yeah, I was. I had moved out of the state for 10 years, and I was up in Maryland, and I saw the craft brew industry really take off and explode up there. And I had come back with my and went with my son to try to visit some of the local breweries here in the Tampa Bay area five years ago, and we were lucky to find three or four. And like you said, now there's 96, so it's been just 
an amazing explosion over the last five years. Well, and to Christian's point as well, I think it's the, it's the beer tourism, right? As, as you mentioned, Carlo, that kind of also jump started in Florida specifically for this beer um, revolution that we're kind of going through. I mean, you said that the, the, the tourism money, you know, that, that Tampa Bay Beer Week has gathered is kind of shifted around with different priorities, but can, anything on Florida beer tourism that you'd like to share? So, I mean, I think not necessarily like bringing people in outside of like our state, but like what used to be the beer spot would be Asheville. So everyone that was going to beer tour has gone to Asheville. Asheville is starting to shift a little bit more into what we would deem as big beer, so things like Anheuser-Busch or Miller like Coors, and not necessarily supporting the little guys that here in Tampa Bay we're giant fans of. So a lot of those Asheville people, even people that like are the brewers in Asheville, are coming to hang out with us here in St. Pete and Tampa Bay, and like those guys are starting to kind of shift down because we do have a larger variety. Where Asheville has a lot of breweries, they're all they're all kind of starting to be very similar. So people are coming into our area, and one of the great things that makes Tampa Bay beer super unique in comparison to a lot of the other brewer, like brew cities is like, we're all best friends. Like, if you come into my brewery almost any time, you'll, if you find my brewer there, you'll also find the guys from Masteries or the guys from Cigar City or the guys from Motor Brewers, or you'll get the team from Paradise just like hanging out with us, not even working or brewing. They're just, they're done with their shift, we're still brewing, they'll come by. So it's just everybody kind of shifts around and that's super unique to our city which I think that gets other people that want to kind of see how that works. Like a lot of our tourism is other brewers. We get the, the brewers from Three Points have been in. There's a, another brewery in Canada that has a similar name to ours and they came to check it out. It was like, what are you doing that's different than what we're doing? Like we want to see how like your that's really cool. So we just get a lot of like, even the other brewers coming in and wanting to spend their money to hang out in Tampa Bay and see how we have curated something kind of so fantastic that honestly within the 90-ish breweries, there's really nobody that would be like, we just don't talk to them. Everybody wants to, when there was an issue where someone had a hop shortage, like they just didn't make it in time for their brew. And they put out a thing on social media and everyone was like, well, this is what I have that I can, this is the style we're looking for, this is what I have that I can throw in. Like, we're not gonna let you not brew. This beer doesn't have on your schedule we're gonna help you. And just the whole community just kind of rallies around each other. It's the culture. It is, yeah. and we're, we're definitely a community and not, a, and not competition. So I think that responds really well to other breweries in other cities. And when other breweries are talking about it, when the guys in Chicago are telling you, oh, you're going on vacation, make sure you stop by Tampa mm -hmm. Bay, like that gets the word out saying that like other people that were maybe looking for a spot to see, are gonna come in and that makes a huge difference in our city. Like our Tampa Bay really thrives on tourism almost exclusively, like that's what keeps us alive. Sure. So we having the beer money coming in because people just wanna check out like my brewery is within walking distance of five other breweries and we know we're super close. A lot of them were existed before we opened and we're just like, hey, we're thinking about buying this space, are you guys okay with that? And they're like, Oh yeah, totally. We have like a program between us and the brewery a couple blocks down, or we'll give you a dollar off if I meet you there first. Like it's just everybody wants to be friends, and that is something that you don't see other places, and that gets other people to come in and out with us. So we've talked about community, we've talked about friends and these connections that we have, but Leonard, explain a little bit about the challenge of growing hops in Florida. Well, up until four or five years ago, everyone would tell you it's impossible to grow hops in Florida. You have to be in the Pacific Northwest or Germany. It can't be done anywhere else uh, in Florida because all the humidity, we're gonna have mildew issues and it's gonna be a huge problem. Um, University of Florida in their research has proven that that's not true. Now what we have done is we're still trying to figure this all out because we started three years ago um, and we've experimented with 22 different varieties of hops, trying to figure out which ones will work, which ones don't work. We planted, for example, in our first year, we planted some Southern Cross, which was a uh, New Zealand hop. And the first year the plants came up and they exploded all the way to the top of the trellis, 20 feet tall, 
and we said, oh my God, this is a great top. The next year, they barely came out of the ground. Uh, and so what's happening is we're not sure what's going to work and what's not going to work yet in Florida. Uh, we've had some varieties like Williamette, which is very popular to be used in a lager beer. Everybody says, oh, we need Williamette, we need Williamette. We found out that a lot of the noble hops will not work in Florida because of the heat. Um, everybody thought that Neo Mexicanus would do well in Florida because it's hot here. Well, Neo Mexicanus comes out of the desert, so it doesn't like all our rain. <laughs> so we found out that that variety doesn't work here. Uh, we have a lot of success with Cascade. We've got a half acre of Cascade hops, and they're doing very well. We're in our third year of growing Cascade. Um, and we've had some other varieties that we're working with that are, are very promising and doing well for us. We have a Kirin hop, which is a Japanese hop that uh, did real well last year and is coming back this year. Uh, Pacific Gem, Southern Brewer, which is a South African hop. Uh, you guys all get this as a quiz at the end, just so you know. <laughs> Columbus uh, is doing well. We've got some Nugget and some Newport that are doing well. So, so still, we're just trying to figure out which ones are going to work and which ones are not going to work. And I said it's probably going to be at least four to five years before we know really what's going to work in Florida and what's not going to work. Um, and then it's, the trick of it is not just will the hop grow here, but then is that a hop that the brewers want to use in their, in their beers? And how many breweries have you worked with locally with, with your hops? We've worked with about a dozen so far. Um, some of them were home brewers. Uh, one of our biggest fans is Craft Life Brewing out of Land Lakes. Uh, Tim has been using our, our <coughs> hops for three years now, and he does a phenomenal job. He's actually, uh, the first time he brewed with our hops, he goes, oh my God, the beer is so much better using these hops than what I was doing before. So he totally changed, that's one of his primary beers in his brewery. He completely changed the recipe for that beer as a result of using our hops in that beer. Yeah. Uh, we've worked with Southern Lights over in Clearwater. Uh, they use some of our Kirin and Pacific Gem in one of their beers. And it was supposed to be, we, it was supposed to be a very hoppy IPA, and it came out as a sweet lager. And they're like, oh my God, we don't know what to call this thing. And they call it the Frankenstein beer because <laughs> it tastes like a lager, but it's 8% alcohol, and you want to drink a lot of it. <laughs> and it'll put you under the table. So it's a really Frankenstein. It's not the combination of the ingredients. <laughs> That's correct. So uh, they're going, Leonard, we don't know what to call this. We don't know what to do with it. So they still have it in their back room. They haven't put it out for public uh, use on the tap, but they said they'd love to go back there and drink it themselves. It's crazy. <laughs> so the part of the issue is the terroir. Uh, a hop grown in one region of the country, you grow that same hop plant in a different region, and it's gonna have an entirely different flavor. The Chinooks that are grown in the Pacific Northwest have an entirely different flavor than the Chinooks that are grown in the Northeast. There's a lot of hops being grown up in Michigan and New York and Maryland. And in the, the ones coming out of the Pacific Northwest have a real piney flavor to them. The ones in the Northeast tend to be a milder flavor and uh, have a little bit of fruitiness to them and don't have the real strong piney flavor that the Pacific Northwest has. Yeah, it sounds very reminiscent to wine. I'm sure everybody's had a glass of wine in their day, but you, you can't grow the grapes in different regions and, and you know without maintaining that, that lack of consistency, because like to your point, water's different, the soil's different, everything. So we talked a little about the trends of kind of what the brewers are using, and you know, for example, I think the number one category for Great American Beer Fest last year was the Hazy IPA, which is a brand new juicy, they call it a juicy IPA. So it's got a lot of those fruity kind of flavors and, and uh, uh, just reminiscent of, of literally a, a piece of fruit. So 
those are some of the trends in beer, but, but Christian, you know, selling all the, the Florida-specific beer only at your Crowley bar, you know, what kind of trends are you seeing as a proprietor of that, as somebody that actually services the uh, thirsty masses? From, from a beer style perspective, I would say, uh, you know, our, our average customer is uh, it's an older crowd, family-oriented, we don't necessarily get a ton of young folks in there, so we don't have the, 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 the uber craft that come in. Um, but overall, I think almost everyone that comes into our place, they, they just want to try and experience something that's going to be different. Um, IPAs are still like the New England IPA, the Hazy Style IPAs. You know, we get that on tap from anywhere. That's typically a big seller, but um, I've started to see more breweries, at least locally speaking, and, uh, and even just from the consumers that come in on a regular, the customers that come in on a regular basis, um, people still like to drink a, a, a really well done Pilsner. Lager, um, and I think uh, I think a lot of people forget sometimes that uh, that sometimes get lost in craft beer, right? Like it's a uh, it's you know uh, a lot of non-craft drinkers, I guess, if you want to say, or, or your, your average beer drinker, uh, sometimes associated with it's got to be an IPA or, uh, or some sort of crazy barrel-aged you know, imperial stout or whatever it is. Um, so we we um, we have only twelve beer tanks. I mean, it's not we don't. Have big spot to begin with, but we almost always have at least one tap now that's dedicated to a lager, pilsner, kolsch, something more traditional type style. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we, we just we, we fly through a lot of it. Yeah. And so I think that's been a big change, at least in the last, I mean, we've been open a year and a half, but I've definitely seen that shift in the last nine to 12 months. Carl, I want to talk to you about the beer problem, but no matter what we say. Well, I went to Pepin's Beers with Attitude last week, and they have 58 breweries there. And one of the one of the things I came away with from that festival was everything was sweet and it was either sweet and fruity or it was very grapefruity IPA. And there really wasn't a lot of more of the traditional beer styles that uh, that are out, you know, that we've grown up with. And there was actually one brewery there from Ireland that actually had the more traditional beers. And I found that those were the ones I really liked from the festival rather than all the, uh, the fruity uh, beers that are out there nowadays. I, yeah, I've seen the same trend, and, and Carl, I was just asking you because I think as we were talking upstairs again, you, you have such a plethora of knowledge over the, the years of your involvement with Beer Week and Beyond and Overflow. You know, the discrepancy between a traditional beer and a more fruity, a more adventurous, or the evolution that there is. Do you see that as a sign of this? And again, you pop up in the Wall Street Journal any other week, you'll see it. There's a beer crack, crack beer bubble that's going to burst, or there's something else that's going to change. What are your thoughts on, on, on the overall beer bubble? Uh, so I want to touch base on Bruce's attitude for a second. And I, I find Bruce's attitude is one of the most delightful, hilarious beer festivals to me. <laughs> because like when you get there, there are a lot of like pastry boys and a lot of like super sweet sounds. And then you realize that Pepin is a Budweiser distributor. <laughs> like Pepin is owned by Budweiser. And it's funny to think about a giant festival from beer that you wouldn't innately think tastes like beer coming from a distributor that is owned by Budweiser. Like, so it's just so funny that, that, that that's what you see in that festival. But the beer trend is kind of like, it's on super far ends of the spectrum. You get like a lot of really huge hype coming from pastry stouts, which is gonna be like the German chocolate cupcake, angry chair, or- I was wondering what pastry boy was. Thank yeah, pastry boy was good. It's uh, angry chair names that like, has a beer that they named the diabetes. Like they know that this beer is like, it's it's really a funny label. Like, it's, it's, hurts your feelings. Like, I mean, it's so good, but it is like the sweetest piece of cake you could ever want. It is like super sweet, like overly sweet even. And I love the guy that every show, so I would drink that beer all day. But then like you get the other guys, like uh, the Green Bench crew that are really hyping up what is a giant trend on the slow pour Pilsner. If you have any patience in your life, please by all means check in Green Bench. Get that slow pour pills. It does take about three minutes to get that beer poured properly, but it is 100% worth it. So, like, they're 
craft beer in itself has such a wide like span that as much as people are like, oh, there's no way you can keep drinking these pastry stouts all day, clearly craft beer is gonna die. There is also the breweries that really are knocking out super clean pilsners or just like a really perfect lager or our buddies over at Rap made uh, just a dreamy German style beer almost exclusively. And those beers hit, there are beers that taste like beer like you would think. Uh, they're super accessible. They're definitely, if you think that you don't like craft beer and you hang out with the crew at Rap for any minute, they have 40 beers on tap, one of them is gonna be the beer that tastes like beer that you wanted. So like, there, I don't necessarily think we're gonna get to like the bubble that we're gonna max out and beer's gonna stop being cool. Because historically it has been shown that even when we're in like a massive recession, people still wanna drink beer. Yeah, like, true. You still, need, you still need that moment where you can like go out with your friends and relax, get back, forget that we're in a giant recession or we were in a giant recession, whichever. Uh, and have a beer with your friends. And that is one of the things that, it's a luxury item that people are never gonna give up. So like, they go, maybe you go to movies less or maybe spend less money shopping at Amazon, but everyone is still out, as long as you're not legal age, out drinking a beer and trying to forget that, you know, sometimes life isn't awesome. But also remembering that that's where your friends are and life is kind of awesome still. Yeah, I, I, I agree, life is awesome. Um, the, stack, the stack that comes to mind when you, when you talk about you know the brewery on every corner i think most recently what i saw in 2018 was there's 25 breweries per million people in the uk in the united states there's 11. so there's still a lot of room to grow i would argue we say there's twice as much that we could fit into into what we've got now uh, based off those statistics so um, even looking at christian's space like yeah. he he has a growlers are there but he doesn't have a ton of breweries within like walking distance of where they are, and it's still a huge population to cater to. Yeah, but go ahead. I was gonna say, you, you get the win-win. You, you get, there's more breweries there, you get more on tap, you can grow. Right. So right. yeah, I, I mean, that's part of it. Like, if we look at just Tampa Bay and the 95 breweries that exist, everyone's like, it's gotta, it's gotta fade, it's gonna fall off. There's, 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 there's too many that are popping up, and there's, I mean, we exist because, uh, to a certain, if you got lucky, but there was some, where we wanted to go um, but there is a pocket and there are multiple pockets across the entire Bay Area where there aren't any breweries There's the, so the craft beer in that sense isn't nearly as accessible to the masses that live out in those areas um, and I think there's lots of places to do that um, not just Tampa Bay has still plenty of those pockets and Florida as a whole has plenty of those pockets and, so I, I'm selfishly speaking just to the state, but I know, you know, we talk about there's 300 something breweries in the state. Um, I think in Florida, I forget currently if I'm wrong, I know we're the third or fourth most populous state in the country right now. I know we're top five, it's right up there in the world. Third, third, yeah, so, and then if you look at Oregon, I think Oregon has close to 300 breweries and they've got like 25% of the population. So it's fairly sustainable. Um, there's, there's, there's more room for it. You just have to get find places and you build a community within an area. And that becomes sort of where, where, where you hit your, your average person, so to speak. Give them something to taste, something to drink, and let them experience what craft beer really is about. So I wanted to expand on a little bit, again, just because of, of your particular stance. You know, some folks out here may not be A, familiar, or, or maybe B, they've never tried or haven't tried a lot of craft beer. Maybe they've gotten burned with one of those super hoppy Northern, you know, north, northwestern beers that you referred to. Um, Christian, how do you, when someone walks into your bar and says, what is this place? Like, how do you, how do you, because you don't have Bud Light on tap. You don't have Bud. I mean, you, you don't have normal stuff. So how, how do you ease them into it to get them to try something? Well, I've had to make the argument. I had a customer the other day who said, well, there's a Budweiser facility in Jacksonville, so why can't you carry them? It's a Florida beer. So that was an interesting conversation. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we, we really try to take, um, uh, Carla kind of said it with crap, right? You go in to find four. I believe that if someone's had a bad experience with craft beer, they just haven't had the right beer. And it's not to say that beer isn't for everyone. Some people just don't want to have beer. But if, 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 if you normally drink, be 
beer, uh, whatever brand, Coronas or anything like that, and there is a beer and crap that's out there for you. I think sometimes uh, certain uh, you you can feel slightly intimidated by not knowing a lot, um, and and I always tell people uh, prior to opening a bar, I never worked in a bar, I never had anything to do with a bar or anything in hospitality. I just wanted to try a different beer. I don't even consider myself a good beer expert. Everyone jokes with me, they're like, "What does this taste like?" My general response is. <laughs> that's, how, that's how you judge a beer, right? And I've gotten better about being able to pick out flavors and profiles and maybe the different hops I've used, but I, I just like to try new and different things. So I try and relate my own experience um, to the people that come in and say, no, you just, as long as you're willing to try something and you're open-minded about it, there is something out there for you. There's, I'm 100% convinced of that. Carlos is like lit up when I said, how do you get somebody to drink a beer? Go ahead. Um, so it's, I love beer so hard. Um, <laughs> so it's one of the funny things that like a lot of people think that beer really is just not accessible to them. And they're just like, I only like Budweiser. I like this kind of beer. And they often, I think people are intimidated by adding the name craft to beer. And they're just like, oh, it's craft beer. I don't like it. But I mean, my friends down in like, the Senate made a Mexican law. A Mexican lager is Corona. It's exactly what it is. It's exactly the style of beer that they make. If you like a Corona, you can make a Mexican lager. One of my favorite questions when I'm behind the bar is, and I'm gonna tell you a really bad dad joke, so bear with me for a second. Uh, one of my favorite questions behind the bar is, what is the lightest beer? And I've stolen this joke from an actual dad, as I know that I am not a dad, uh, but Bob Sylvester, who I've seen somewhere, and his favorite response to what is the lightest beer is that they all weigh the same. <laughs> so I'm not going to give you a beer because it's the lightest beer because that to me doesn't necessarily make sense. They all weigh the same. Uh, and light could be like, are you looking for a beer that has a lighter color? Are you looking for a beer that doesn't have a ton of flavor? Are you looking for a beer that doesn't have a ton of calories? Like light beer doesn't like register necessarily. I'm like, I still don't know what you're asking me for. But typically we make uh, or makes a mango wit and when you hear a fruited beer, you would immediately be like, that's not what I'm looking for. I want Budweiser. But most of the people that are coming in looking for a Bud Light or a Miller Light, and I'll give you that mango wit, and I'm just like, this beer is delicious. It's made with beer ingredients. It's cool. Um, and that was kind of my, my long standing joke because Budweiser is actually, the ingredients for beer is like hops and grain and yeast and barley, and Budweiser is made with corn and water, and those are all the things. And that technically isn't beer at all, and I kind of want to argue that all the time. But I'm like, you're looking for beer that, that tastes like beer, but you're basing it on a beer that isn't made with beer ingredients. So, like, you can very easily shift over from, I don't like beer because it's intimidating, to just a regular lager that is fine, or a Pilsner is fine, or a super easy wit. Like, there's still accessible beers that you were going to recognize if you've been growing up in a frat party. You're still going to know this beer because it's just like the beer that you think you're looking for. It's just made a little nicer with a little bit more care and actual humans that care about <laughs> enjoying your beer. And those are the things that, like, we are looking for uh, behind those kettles is we want you to enjoy the beer. We don't want you to necessarily just pound for the sake of drinking beer. I want you to drink that slow pour pills. It's made with care. I don't want you to it's poured with care. I don't want you to enjoy it. And so I think that like that's our goal in craft beer is there is a beer for everyone, even if you think that you're a craft boy that just likes Bud Light. Like we probably have a beer for everyone. A lot of the good people here. Oh yes, yes, <laughs> former craft boys. I love you all. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. Yeah, I was gonna say to a certain degree, you're on the, you're you're trying to break the perception that people have of what craft beer is, right? And so. The so, light so, yeah. Hey, I want something light. Well, you can have a black lager or a short beer that's dark in color that drinks incredibly light. And so you get to there's just the, the, the perception people have of what it is. It's it's trying to educate them and breaking that perception. And I think that's the starting point. Perception is a thing, and I worked for five years um, under one of the big guys. I'm not going to name him, even though we had several times tonight. But um, what I found, <laughs> I what I found was the uh, the easy transition is food. 
you really haven't or you haven't experienced craft beer, try it with food. If you, if you try a, a porter or a, a chocolate style with a piece of chocolate cake or um, something, uh, the way food works, it would be a little bit different than wine, but it's kind of like, you know, light beer um, necessarily doesn't go with light food, if you will, but you can try something like a really rich um, marzen or something in the fall time. Most anything, any fall beer you can get with a slice of pumpkin pie or a roasted chicken, stuff like that really helps. And it brings up the flavor of both because to Carlos point, beer is food. There's nothing in beer that is not food besides water. So um, I, there is a fun fact I wanted you to bring out, speaking of ingredients of beer that can also be overpriced food, hop shoots. Can you hop tell shoots. us about hop shoots, Leonard? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're very close to hop shoots. Oh man, I can't wait. You promised me a plate, so. Couple weeks. Um, what happens is when the hops first emerge from the ground uh, in the spring, uh, especially uh, the, we only, when we only train two to four of the vines that comes out of the hop plant up the trellis and then we cut all the others off and, and typically we throw them away. What they do in Belgium is everybody from Paris goes to Belgium in the springtime to have hop shoots in the restaurants and they can sell up to 500 euros per kilo of hop shoots. So hop shoots are considered the world's most expensive vegetable. Um, last year, in March, I had a bunch of chefs from Disney World who wanted to come. They were all craft brewer enthusiasts, and they wanted to come out to the hop farm and see the hop farm. And it happened to be at that point in time, the hop shoots were coming out. So I went out in the field with these chefs from the best restaurants in Disney and had them pick their own hop shoots. And we got out to the grill, and we grilled them right there in the hop yard. And oh my God, they were amazing. <laughs> is it like an artichoke, or what is the flavor? What the is flavor it? is like an asparagus, okay. and you know, if you cook them on the grill, it makes them look a little garlic and uh, butter, and then throw them on the grill. The, they're just amazing. Uh, I'm working with my cousin in Benedetto's restaurant in Land of Lakes, and we're hoping to be able to uh, get some on the menu. Uh, here this spring, <laughs> uh, if everything works as planned. So, That's fantastic. And then he would also like to do a beer with the hops, made with the hops from our our hop farm. Uh, he's really into farm to table, and it would be from our farms to his table. We're, we're all part of the same family, so. Yeah. I was gonna ask you how you encourage people to try craft beer, but you probably say something along the lines of, my, my house are in. <laughs> That's right. They just start drinking. Well, yeah, and what's interesting is um, a lot of people use the pellet dive stops in the beers, you know, that's what the big guys all use. Uh, we're promoting whole cone hops. Uh, such as uh, Sierra Nevada uses all the Hong hops in their beers, and Victory, and uh, Deschutes, and some of the others that are well-known breweries out of the Pacific Northwest. And what we, what we, what was interesting is I mentioned Craft Life. I was there one time, and we had he had a customer who came into the brewery. I was there delivering some hops, and the customer came into the brewery and said, you know, I've been in Florida three years and I can't find a good beer because I'm from New York and all the, the breweries I used to go up to always use fresh cone hops in their beers and the beers were amazing. He says, and since I've been in Florida, I can't find a good beer. So Tim goes up to his tap and pours a beer and he hands it to the guy and goes, try this. And he goes, oh my God. I've been waiting three years to find this beer because it was made with, he was expecting the grassiness that you get in the whole cone hops that you don't get in the pellet form, pellet form out of the beers. And he goes, I've been waiting three years to find a good beer here in Florida and I finally got one. 
<laughs> and that's because of the shelf life, correct? It's hard to get fresh hops anywhere, especially exactly. down a couple state lines, some out of that, that region. Yeah. It's very expensive. I mean, there are a few breweries who do fresh hop beers here in Florida, but they're flying, uh, when they're fresh picked, they have to be used within 48 hours. And so they're having to pay to fly those hops from the Pacific Northwest of Florida to go into the kettle within 48 hours. And what we're trying to do is produce a hop here in Florida where they can just drive down the street and get it and put it in the net. Super fresh. And if we're running out of time, we're running low on time. <laughs> I want to talk about all this stuff we can talk about for a lot more time, but just briefly, we, we, we spent nearly the entire time talking about the history of beer and, and what it's done to the Tampa Bay area and, and how we all got here. Um, guys, I'll start with Christian, then we'll go on to Carla, and then lastly, Leonard. You know, what does the future of craft beer look like? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's going to continue to grow. I think, um, you know, five years ago, I don't think we could, we could have this conversation right like this you know, in Tampa or Florida for that matter. Um, so I think we're just at the, the beginning of, of uh, uh, I don't want to call it like the craft revolution, that sounds a little bit cheesy. But, uh, right, you get a craft business. Yeah, I, I, just, I think it's going to continue to grow. I think, uh, I don't think there's anything overly unique that, that our place does. I think there's more places that are going to pop up, similar to what we do, that can focus on local Gonna get, I know Leonard is uh, one of the bigger ones here, but there's probably three or four other pop farms in the state. Well, there's over 15 now. 15? You said, there you go. Um, <laughs> um, and so you're just, uh, there's there's no reason why, uh, at least I don't believe why you're going to continue to see that growth take place and, um, and, and, and start having different things like this that really take hold in other cities as well. So yeah. I think it's easy. If, if you're a, a, a fan of and being able to try different things, um, I think we're in a, in a good spot for the next year, a couple years to come. So that's it. I think the way that I see uh, craft beer in the Bay and the way that like you guys are going to see craft beer in the Bay is going to be super different because of the side of the fence that we're going to stay on. So like in my world, I'm going to keep being busier. I'm going to keep having more beers, breweries to represent. I'm going to have more fantastic brands to promote. Um, and that's, that's just going to be busy forever. I think on your end, it's going to be a lot of the breweries are going to not necessarily be the giant hype squad that you're going to see in Kroger and Publix across the country, but they're going to be the brewery on your corner, the, the cheers version of your neighborhood. That it's going to be a lot more breweries that you can get it like two day old IPAs, which is going to be the freshest you can get that IPA and perfect because it's a couple blocks away and I think on on the consumer end it's going to be a lot more neighborhood breweries and a lot less giant monster breweries and to be honest like that's kind of the moment that I'm waiting for like as much as I really love the massive breweries that I, like I love being able to call my friends out in California and be like hey my friends at Sarah City made this this cool beer it's going to be shipped out in a couple days and we all look out on our shelves for it but I also like being able to be like, we at Overflow made a beer that would 100% not be shelf stable because I, we put some super weird vegetables in it and it's just not going to be able to be canned and shipped out. But you can stop by in the next few days before we, we kick the kegs and you can enjoy this super rad beer that you wouldn't have had an opportunity to do. And I think a lot of other breweries are going to be that cheers kind of neighborhood brewery that you can enjoy the entire spectrum because it'll change depending on what you guys are interested in. So if you come into our brewery and you're like, I'd like to see more stouts and sours, you're who we're catering to. We're still gonna make a few sours because that's what we on staff want to drink at the moment. But when we start shifting what our palate wants, we'll make a couple beers that fit what we want, but we're definitely gonna make whatever it is you came in and told me that you wanted to drink because my doors are only gonna stay open if you come in and drink with me. So if you tell me you want salads, I'll make salads. But if you tell me that you don't want salads anymore and you only want lagers, a lot more of the taps are gonna lean in that direction. So that's kind of what I think the progression of the community is gonna be, is honestly, neighborhood bars that are whatever you want. Like if you ask for it, we'll make an attempt to make it, even if it's an anaphetic <laughs> So the epitome of 
craft beer, yeah. neighborhood, neighborhood beer. Yeah. Mr. Lynn? I'm agreeing with Carla. Um, you know, a lot of these breweries are starting up with the dream that they're going to go into national distribution. And that's not going to happen for everybody. There's going to be a very few small number of breweries that are ever able to get to that level. Um, I've talked to some brewers here. In, I, I've been to every bar or every brewery in the Tampa Bay area <laughs> at least once. Um, and I, I would love talking with the brewers. And I talked to one brewer who bought a bunch, he moved into a new facility, bought a bunch of equipment because he was going to go into distribution. And then he said, all of a sudden everybody's trying to do this. He goes, I can't compete. He said, so I'm downsizing. I'm going back to being that local brewery in my neighborhood that caters to the people who live in my neighborhood because that's my niche in the marketplace. And I know a lot of home brewers who are in the process of over the next probably two to three years opening their own small breweries. And that's what people like. I mean, people want to go into a brewery where there's a family-oriented atmosphere where I can sit down and I can talk to the brewer and he can tell me about all the ingredients that he's using and what his plans are for the next beer. And you don't get that in the big breweries. They're very sterile and corporate. And we, we saw that. We lived in Maryland for 10 years. I, I lived in the town where Flying Dogs got their start. And we used to go to Flying Dog and hang out in there on Saturday mornings and, and just, you know, we were there with the brewers and the staff and we drank beers all day long. Uh, we'd ask for a sample and they'd give us a pint. <laughs> and then over the next three to five years, we saw them become very corporate and all of a sudden you couldn't get near the brewery unless you had a reservation three months in advance to go in there. Saturdays. Uh, we knew the folks that worked there, so we could still get in, but mm -hmm. most people couldn't. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. But it's, I think people are looking for that place where they feel welcome. The cheers atmosphere that you mentioned is what people are looking for in the brewery. And I think the successful breweries are going to be the small breweries that cater and provide that friendly, family oriented atmosphere to their customers. Before we go, Len, thank you for that. Tell people again, um, you know, I'll go all the way online uh, back to me and take a home, but where can they find you, website, any social media, is there anything that people can, can follow just to stay in touch with the conversation as you continue to grow this? You're, you're only halfway through your own estimate, so there's a lot of work you still gotta do. Yeah, you know, we're, uh, our company name is FloridaHotBrewers.com. We're on Instagram and we've got a website and we're also on Facebook. I've got some stickers here if you want a sticker. Uh, put on the wall. Uh, and he always brings hops with him too, so if you, if you don't know what these yeah. things are, better call hops. He just got them in his pocket. <laughs> no, I don't know. All the time. Um, yeah, we, I brought a sample of, uh, these are whole cone dried hops, so they don't look like rabbit pellets like you normally see. And so I brought these, so if you want to take a look at them and see what they look like when they're dried. Uh, I don't have any of the, the fresh hops, because uh, those won't be yet available till July. We'll be doing our first pick uh, around July 20th, and uh, we actually do a new pick every year where the home brewers and the, and the craft breweries can come out and pick their own hops and, and make their own beer with it. And so we'll be announcing that on our website. Uh, and for the last few years, it's been around July 20th that we've been able to uh, have make the hops available for harvest. Sounds awesome. Miss Carla? Oh gosh. <laughs> Just a few things. There's a lot of things, but. There's lots of things. Uh, so, April 20th is Overflow's very first anniversary party. We'll be throwing a carnival. We're bringing back some memory dates. We're not really sure why. So, April 20th, we will be there. Uh, how to be shindig. Um, and then you can find me kind of everywhere. Um, but again, Tampa Bay Beer Week, we do halfway there. It's coming up super soon. See me out on the Tampa Bay Ale Trail with our monthly meetups because we run that too. Um, so we'll be halfway there. We'll be almost there, which is the Homebrew Festival in January, and then we'll be back uh, slinging all the things during Beer Week 
or if you look at literally any t-shirt in all of the bay, I probably would wear that. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Christian, we have no t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, uh, our, our, the name of our growler bar is Brew, B-R-U for a growler bar. Um, we are in, I like to say Northwest Inn, I guess Gary, you say Odessa, it's much further out than it actually is. It's 10 minutes from the airport. And it helps us do a lot of my events. <laughs> yeah, that's right, it's two buses to get there. Uh, you can find us, our website is just brewfl.com. We are on, I say we, my wife does all of our social media, so Instagram, Facebook, uh, it's like on Twitter, I think, as well. It's just at the Brew Growler. Um, we're constantly, again, we meet on Tuesday usually, um, constantly posting stuff online, doing tournaments and things like that. Um, so, yeah, come check us out. Great. And again, my name is Donnie Gallagher from the uh, Craft Brews and Geek News podcast. Um, we, uh, we often are hanging out at the local charity beer fest. We've supported the Rotary Club, Hospice, Boys and Girls Club of America to the tune of about $100,000 over the last decade. So. We really love doing that stuff, it is our passion. Um, we love to use uh, science and industry knowledge to help inspire local adult beer drinkers to um, raise money and, and bring um, uh, support local economies. You know, it's just a fantastic industry community. I thank all of you guys, and of course, everyone in the room here, if you haven't, which you probably have. Um, upstairs, the fourth floor, the history by the pint. So bring your friends, bring your family. There's a lot of hyper-local beer stuff there. Um, there's exhibits and there's uh, there's artifacts. I think they're they're referenced and uh, a lot of the process. It really take you from zero to sixty on all things Tampa Bay beer. Um, so I thank you and um, thank you guys. The Saint Summer skateboard is the best thing. The Saint Summer skateboard. There's a, there's a brewery pump that they used to pull beer out on a skateboard up there. So you've got to see that. Um, but but guys and everyone here, thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you. You've been listening to the official podcast of the Brewmasters Club, Craft Brews and Geek News. Grab a beer with the guys and be sure to subscribe to catch additional content. Add this podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. Chat with the guys on Twitter at Brewmasters Club and Facebook and online at www.brewmasters.club. Cheers.